Okay, time to get the show on the road, as they say. And so, again, this is a condensed version of what we used to do. These used to be 15-minute lectures, really, for two days. It was kind of a rough Saturday, actually, when we did this. So this is the light start that you're going to get today. And we're going to start focusing on the uh, extracranial vascular system manifestations of stroke. And with that, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Vivek Misra. Um, he just joined the stroke faculty at the Eddie Scurlock Stroke Center at Methodist. And he's going to tell us in 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes, the diagnosis and medical management of stroke. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Dr. Lumsden. And what I'll be speaking on is you can write a thousand page book which I have to summarize in less than 10 minutes. So, so moving forward um, to, to stroke management, I would also have to acknowledge my colleague, Jay Volpe, and these are his slides. He's, a, he's vacationing with family, so he's put me on the firing line of all the vascular surgeons with, with the guns in Texas. So, <laughs> so moving forward, acute ischemic stroke, the diagnosis is essentially a clinical diagnosis. When these patients present with focal neurological deficits, then we have to assume that this is an, an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, because most importantly, we, we, we don't have any cardiac enzymes and we don't have any EKGs of the brain. The EEGs of the brain, they, they don't really tell us specifically it's an ischemic stroke or could it be something else. So most importantly, it is the acute onset of a focal neurological deficit and it has to be acute in onset or someone is waking up with those symptoms. <laughs> Stroke mimics are also pretty common, and they also show up within the treatable time windows for thrombolysis. And most importantly, when we suspect a patient to be a stroke mimic, at the same time, we also don't want to hurt the patient with acute stroke reperfusion treatments. So some of these mimics, they can be, have, they can be having migraines, or they may have woken up with a seizure, or they may have had a seizure which was unwitnessed. And then there can be other several stroke mimics, including uh, patients presenting with simple vertigo, they may be intoxicated from alcohol use. So those are the things we certainly have to keep in mind when we assess those patients. So most importantly, what really gives up, gives a way that this patient presenting with these symptoms is likely to be a real stroke is patients presenting with hypertension or with a hypertensive crisis, and then they have these focal neurological deficits or they have altered sensorium, decreasing mental status. Some of the pitfalls, well, these are some old definitions. For example, TIA used to be defined as focal neurological deficits, which go away completely within 24 hours. That's an old definition. And this is primarily because with modern brain imaging, with MRIs, you can see evidence of infarction if these symptoms last for even more than an hour. So traditionally, this has been the definition 24 hours, but all those patients who may neurologically recover completely within 24 hours, they may still have an ischemic stroke. And we, the only time we say that this is a TIA is once we've done definitive brain imaging and there is absence of infarction um, on specifically on the MRI scans. Some other pitfalls, patients can be intoxicated, they may be driving, and then they may have a car accident, they may dissect their carotid artery and then have a stroke. So apart from some of these things, we may think that this patient is intoxicated, but they can still have a real stroke. And then the idea is to use more definitive cerebral blood flow brain imaging, as well as put clinical criteria to, to then make a diagnosis of an ischemic stroke in that situation. And most importantly, when they present with focal neurological deficits, they can be either an intracerebral hemorrhage or an ischemic stroke, and the treatment obviously is exactly, is exactly opposite of one versus the other. So which is where we do a CT head in the acute phase to rule out a bleed, and then the consideration for acute reperfusion treatment begins. We can also sometimes do an MRI in the acute phase, though less institutions do it, since the MRIs can be much more time consuming. But eventually, when they get admitted to the stroke service, we still would repeat an MRI because that gives out what could be the mechanism of the ischemic stroke, and then it aids in decision making for secondary stroke prevention. And obviously, vessel imaging is the key, and we can use MRIs, CTs, with angiography or we can use Dopplers. Convulsion angiography is done much less frequently these days, and it is more therapeutic for, for large artery occlusions who we may choose to treat endovascularly. So this is a CT scan on a patient, and this, this CT is fairly nonspecific. And on this CT, I'll try to use the mouse. I don't think there's a, there's a pointer here. <laughs> 
But on this CT, if you look at the dark shadows around the ventricles, so this patient may be hypertensive for a long, long time, and all we see, these are just chronic microvascular changes, and this patient then may be presenting with another ischemic stroke, and you'll never see that on the CT scan. Then this is another CT scan on a patient who presents with a right MCA syndrome with left hemiparesis, and you can see an involvement in part. And this is much more recent compared to the ventricles, and that tells us that this is a much more recent stroke. But this patient certainly is not within treatable time windows. Even if he were to have a right MCA occlusion, then we would not intervene and treat because it's an evolved infarct already, and there's no point trying to treat a stroke when it has already damaged the, the entire part, which is ischemic. The, the CT to the right is another patient who presented with quote-unquote stroke symptoms, but these findings may be a little subtle, but you can see a little bit of camel in the occipital lobe on this side. So this is where brain imaging in the acute phase makes us really determine an ischemic stroke versus an intracerebral hemorrhage. And by the way, this patient also has an ischemic stroke because ischemic strokes, as part of their natural history, when the artery is open spontaneously, there will be hemorrhagic conversion, and that is something called as luxury perfusion, and that is where we have to tie each of these, connect the clinical and the imaging, and then make decisions on, on, on treatment. We also do an echo as part of determining the stroke etiology. Long-term monitoring to look for paroxysmal AFib is becoming increasingly important because a lot of strokes who we call as cryptogenic, by old definitions, almost 50%, if you were to do long-term cardiac monitoring or use a loop recorder, you will find them to have paroxysmal AFib, and then you will certainly treat those patients with anticoagulants. Looking for a PFO is not really needed as much as it was initially thought, because you know, with paroxysmal AFib being much more common in cryptogenic strokes, PFO then becomes not, not as big of, of, of an issue, to be honest with you. However, if we do see a PFO and the patient doesn't have AFib, doesn't have a cardiac thrombus, doesn't have a large artery athero, then you would certainly want to chase DBT to build a case for paradoxical embolism, which is pretty much, which, which is, is much less common, so to say. And then a lot of patients who may have chronic ischemic strokes, they can also have cognitive symptoms that do need to be teased out. Um, since depression is also common after a stroke and you would want to treat that depression as well, and some new research to suggest that using SSRIs can also help improve neural plasticity, and that also improves the non-depression real stroke symptoms. So moving forward with acute stroke reperfusion treatments, it is always handled by the, the neurology stroke service. Um, what we really expect when patients have an in-hospital stroke or they present to the ED with stroke symptoms is obviously put in for a, a code stroke page because all stroke centers, they are required to meet certain metrics, which are time-bound metrics. The first thing to do is to do a STAT CT and also check for blood glucose. And obviously, just some basic information we need is just to identify, is the patient taking any anticoagulants, which would make a difference to how we treat. And also to establish when was this individual last known, last known normal, um, or when did the symptoms start? Because we have a specific time window for thrombolysis, about four and a half hours, which is an absolute. Um, at least in the current system of care. And then we also have to identify patients who, apart from thrombolysis, are the ones we have to take to the angio suite for a mechanical thrombectomy. This is what is being done as of now and has been there for the last few years, much, you know, much more than a few years. And the field is also now moving towards treating patients in extended time windows who wake up with a stroke or who, do, who you don't know when the stroke really started. And that is where advanced brain imaging, cerebral blood flow imaging is, is used to make a determination. I don't have the slides to show how that is done. But that gives us an idea of what part of the brain is already infarcted and what is the ischemic penumbra which is retrievable if you were to really reperfuse the brain. And then finally, secondary medical management is the patient has already had a stroke, so what do you do to, to ensure that they don't have another one? So, in this situation, obviously, we have conventional vascular risk factors which apply to the heart, to the peripheral vasculature, as well as to the brain. Hypertension obviously remains the most significant risk factor in terms of secondary stroke prevention. And even though there are so many drugs which are used, what has been determined is the best agent to be used for secondary stroke prevention is ACE inhibitors. Even though you can use all agents which are available, considering that they 
may have cardiovascular disease, they may also have renal disease and so on. But ACE inhibitors, at least for our vascular neurology practice, is what really is preferred, even though other agents, depending on the patient requirement, would certainly be, be important as well. Statins, obviously, they, they have become a standard of care, and the idea is not to have a specific number for LDL. The idea is to use high-dose statins in the initial phase to, to subsequently reduce the stroke risk, and then the statin dose can obviously be modified later on based on how the LDL is. And antiplatelets are obviously just like MI prevention for stroke prevention. Antiplatelets come in the picture, but there's a certain difference. Um, the two common antiplatelets in use are aspirin and Plavix with their pros and cons. And then the other antiplatelets which are also used um, in the cardiology world, for example, ticagrelor and silosazole are also used in non-stroke vascular disease, but they don't have a role in ischemic stroke prevention. Using dual antiplatelets, combining aspirin and Plavix at one point of time was never a consideration but it has come in consideration in patients who have symptomatic intracranial stenosis um, and is also investigational patients with minor strokes and TIAs, but only for the short term, for three months or so. And finally, anticoagulants, the indication is in patients with AFib, patients who have low ejection fraction, um, they used to be on warfarin at one point, but the WARCEP study, which is warfarin versus aspirin and reduced cardiac ejection fraction, it doesn't really show a benefit of anticoagulation in those situations. Um, there's more bleeding concerns with warfarin. So people are now, in this situation, investigating the new anticoagulants versus aspirin to see if it makes a difference. Arterial hypercoagulable state, cerebral venous thrombosis, obviously we anticoagulate. In patients who have strokes, because of arterial dissections, then it becomes a judgment call, because in all dissections, anticoagulation versus antiplatelet, there's no difference. But some people, they still choose to anticoagulate based on collaterals, vascular anatomy, <coughs> the presence of an intraluminal thrombus, if you can, if you can see that on, on imaging. For anticoagulants, NOACs are usually preferred now in patients with non-valvular AFib. For all other conditions, it still remains the, the old Coumadin. CREST-2 is, is a study which is NIH-funded study, and this is on asymptomatic carotid stenosis in excess of 70%, and CREST-2 is investigating whether these patients will benefit from aggressive medical treatment as it exists now versus endarterectomy versus stenting. And this is where uh, the field is also looking at investigating that subgroup of patients. Thank you. When does the uh, DWMRI become positive after a stroke? What, what's, the what's the earliest time point you would expect it to be positive? Certainly. So diffusion rated imaging will be positive in the first few minutes, four to five minutes of an ischemic stroke. There is also another category of patients who have a real stroke, but they are DWI negative. And those are the patients you do not want to miss. So which is why we, we don't really you know, depend on a DWI in the hyperacute phase to be able to do it. Um, and obviously, MR imaging takes a long time, and that would also mean delaying thrombolysis. And so we've been very interested in that neuro. This is a new classification system, the NeuroArc classification that defines type 2 stroke as, as covert CNS infarction, which are purely DWMRI positive lesions yes. in the brain. Now, the reason this is important to all of us in this room is that you have no idea what this is from carotid endorectomy or thoracic aortic endografts. In the reported instance in Tavar, for example, who's one of the few groups that have actually looked at it, is of the order of 70 to 90 percent. So you don't have to consent a patient tell them there's a 79 percent chance of type 2 stroke from this yes. procedure. Yes. And that's well yeah. known. And once we, for example, when we do a thrombectomy on a patient, we also see hits all over the brain after thrombectomy. But I think, you know, once this is done, if the patient is symptomatic, then that is an indication that this, this is much more than the natural course of the procedure, perhaps. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm.